everybody and welcome to taking care of business on 88.1 fm we are recorded from the studios of wcwp the abrams communication live from studio two and we've got a wild show for you today we have a friend of the show uh, steve rosenfield who's here today and he's going to talk about a long island institution he's going to be talking to us about my father's place and i'm actually holding a book that was uh in my hands right here here we go because it is radio. Uh, this book is like truly unbelievable. I actually saw the debut. I saw this as the debut. It may have been debuted somewhere else, but I saw the debut of this at the Long Island Music Hall of Fame Music Awards, which I covered for the press and was the subject of a prior show. And not only is this a book about a tremendous experience about music in the 70s and 80s, but it also has a, a, a wild, nice, very original CD in the back. So you're looking at a book that has both history, photos that are completely rare and unique, music, which is rare and unique, and uh, it's one of those little treasures that you just got to pick up and, and take a look at. So grab your pencils, and uh, I want you to go to myfathersplace.com. Now, if you're actually a resident from this, you know, the, listen, the local listening area here in 88.1 FM out here in Brookville, right off of Northern Boulevard. I know some of you are listening to us in iTunes and all kinds of places, including uh, Anguilla. We, have, we actually have loyal fans at the Dolphin Discovery Center. So hi, hi, guys. And we have people who listen to us in Ireland and all kinds of faraway places. But if you're right here down on Northern Boulevard in the village of Roslyn, there was a venue that was actually kind of almost world famous for a little place. It was called My Father's Place. And um, in its day, there was, uh, according to the website, there were 6,000 shows of 3,000 artists and millions of fans, which is amazing. So let me introduce without further ado, I have Steve Rosenfield. So thank you for coming out to us today and uh, being with us. Thanks, Rich. Thank you, Rich. All right. And uh, we've known each other for quite some time now. Probably 20 years, probably. That's right. And yeah. and, and you hid this gem from me. <laughs> I mentioned it a few times. You didn't hear me. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, okay. My, my bad. <laughs> All right. No, 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 no. It's, uh, you know, some things you don't talk about is the older you get, but uh, some things deserve to come out of the closet uh, after a few years. That's right. And, and, and this is one of those things. Now, uh, for those who are looking at our archives, which you can find right now at TCB Radio, Dot mypodcast.com. We have a lot of rock and roll history in our archives, and this is going to certainly add to that show. But we have uh, Cousin Brucey, who talked about his book, mm-hmm. uh, Rock and Roll and the Beat Goes On. We had Chuck Panazzo of Sticks, who wrote his book called The Grand Illusion. We've had uh, uh, Jen Chapin on as a guest. Uh, we've had um, Ricky Bird of the Joan Jett and Blackheart Band. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now he's with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame house band. Okay. We had Monty Meldick on, who, did a, uh, who was the tour manager of the Ramones. And he wrote a book called On Tour with the Ramones, and he was a fascinating person. And um, who else have we had? We've had um, Brother Mustard. Uh, we had the, the rock band uh, uh, Speed Merchant, mm-hmm. uh, which was the subject of a documentary called State of Rock, which was done by filmmaker Anthony Arkin, son of Alan Arkin. So check out our music archives, and uh, you'll see some great stuff. But let's talk about this book, and the book is called Fun and Dangerous, Untold Tales, Unseen Photos, and Unearthed Music from My Father's Place, 1975 to 1980. And this was written by Steve Rosenfield with Michael Epi Epstein. So let's, let's first talk about Steve Rosenfield. Well, you, you actually were part of the whole scene of My Father's Place. Uh, thanks, Rich. Uh, yeah, I was, uh, I was growing up in Fresh Meadows, Queens, and um, you know, going to Jamaica High School. And uh, when, when did you graduate Jamaica? My wife then went to Jamaica. I believe it was 1976. Oh, I'll have to ask. Okay. 1976. But, uh, but a year before... She graduated a little bit later, but yeah, yeah. I mean, she may know people from that year. Yeah. Right. Uh, it was a big school. Uh, it's uh, Jamaica, Queens. It's got had 3,000 students at that time. It was on three shifts. And uh, so you'd start going to school at 7.30 in the morning. And have like lunch at 10. 8.30. <laughs> or you'd be out by 2 in the afternoon and stuff. 
but uh, I guess the year, it, it turns out it was my junior year, um, I guess I was, well, I was 16, we listen, or I was listening to the radio and I heard uh, this concert from uh, the village of Old Roslyn on the radio. It was uh, on WLIR-FM, which was 92.7, 92.7 institution yeah. back then, and uh, there was a big party going on, and it was it was certainly a bigger party than was going on in my house. So uh, a party so of one. <laughs> it was a party of one for sure. And uh, so I got my junior license back then. You could drive at sixteen, sixteen and a half, and I remember it was sixteen and a half when you could cross the county line from Queens to Nassau County, and uh, that was one of my first destinations. I can't for the life of me remember the first uh, show I went to, but uh, but I, I drove. Found found this little club under the viaduct, under the highway, and uh, there really was a party going on there. It was uh, it was an incredible time. What was your first impression? If you don't have a first recollection, what was your first impression like? Like, what, was there a wow moment? Yeah, it was a dump. Uh, it looked like a dump <laughs> from the outside. <laughs> it uh, it had uh, almost a hand stenciled sign over the door. It used to be a country western bar in the fifties. That's uh, so it was a saloon, and uh, it was a bowling alley first. Then it was a saloon. Uh, or it was a saloon, then it was a bowling alley. And, um, uh, but from the outside, it's very unassuming, and, uh, or was. And, um, you know, you, you just didn't know what was going on in there. And over the years, I spent a lot, a lot of time in there. And, uh, you know, what was really going on there was what was on the stage. So when you got there, if there was music on, there was a huge party going on. Uh, the bar was always filled with fun people who were just having a great time drinking uh, two Borg beers, which were uh, the staple of the profits uh, in the bar business back then. <laughs> uh, Epi, who was the club owner uh, and my partner in this book, uh, organized a, a business deal with an unknown beer brand called Two Borg, and um, we were the largest. Or the, I'm sorry, he was uh, my father's place was the largest. A seller and distributor of Tuborg in the country. Wow. Because And he had a wonderful deal, so it was very, very profitable. So the, the bar was always filled with people drinking Tuborg. And, uh, so it was a very convivial, uh, happy place, uh, but very unassuming. Like, you well, really would not know what was, who was inside and what was going on, even if you drove past it. So how did it get the, pla- how did it get the name My Father's Place? Uh, the name of my father's place uh, was uh, Jay Lanahan was the owner of the real estate, and he brought uh, Epi in as a partner in 1971. Um, he was looking for ways to fill the club. Epi was uh, a college student in Boston and wanted to uh, try his hand at business. And they worked out a deal where Epi would run the club, um, and uh, and which uh, which he did. And... Um, he was partners with uh, Jay Lanahan's son, Jay Jr. Jay Jr. Ah. So Jay Jr. is always called his place, my father's place. Oh, that's so cool. So whatever it was called, that whatever it was called, it was he, Jay Jr. and Epi were contemporaries and friends. So it was always Jay's father's place. Oh, that's really cool. Place. Now, if, if you look at the book, there's just very, very cool and very, very rare photos of some amazing people from the music history. And I'm just thumbing through it, for example. We have Blondie, uh, you know, Deborah Harry, and uh, we have Cindy Lauper. We have, uh, I guess, The Runaways when Joan Jett was part of The Runaways. Their um, first tour in 1976. Yeah, and there she is on the, the, by the way, she's from Long Beach, New York. That's it. So there she is on the left. Uh, you have Levon Helm from The Band, which is pretty, pretty cool. Uh, you have James Brown, uh, sort, mm-hmm. sort of a, <laughs> you know, a well-known, you have Leslie West from Mountain. You have Meatloaf. I actually saw, I saw Meatloaf also in 1978. I guess he was here too. And I saw him at St. John's University. And mm-hmm. that's when he had a cast on because he broke his leg falling oh, off of the stage, stage somewhere. <laughs> and he did Paradise by the Dashboard Lights while in a wheelchair, and <laughs> Carla DeVita, who is the other singer, mm-hmm. you know, she played the female part of the duet. She, I think, got in a wheelchair too, and they, they did the whole duet together. I might have been at that show, Rich. Really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I kind of remember that, you know. Now, now, many, many years later, I was at a student at State University of New York at Binghamton, and I listened to a local station out there called WAAL, mm-hmm. and Carla DeVita debuted her. Um, Vinyl record back then. That's when they had vinyl. 
for all those people out there who remember vinyl. And she had an album called It's a Cool World or What? And she autographed and gave that to me. And I have that to this day. But there's a great. picture of Meatloaf. Uh, uh, that picture of, uh, of uh, Meatloaf with Carla DeVito kissing is, a, is an iconic picture uh, that was taken at the club, actually. And that's the, at the end of Paradise by the Dashboard Lights, for those who know that song, uh, when they embrace at the end. Um, that is, uh, I think, the finest picture ever taken of uh, of that moment, and that's a that's a it's really a seminal moment in rock and roll history uh, that was captured on film beautifully by uh, Gary Gershoff uh, at my father's place. Wow, and and what's amazing is that album was just so huge on so many levels. In fact, what's interesting, a friend of mine, I'll leave his name out, uh, was at the time. A limo driver, and uh, <laughs> he drove Jim Steinman around, who wrote the whole, basically the whole album. So, well, million degrees of separation. Right, and and the other photo uh, of Meatloaf is with Jim Steinman that's in the book, and that's a, a extremely rare photo of both uh, Meatloaf and Jim Steinman together downstairs at my father's place. Very, very, uh, you, there are, we don't know of any another photo of the two wow. of them together at that time. Um, so... Yeah, uh, the the photos work on a lot of different levels. Uh, from inside baseball, seeing this picture of uh, Jim and and Meatloaf together, because people would know there's no picture. We've never seen a picture of Meatloaf and Jim together. Where did this come from? To you, kind of looking at a, a Ramones picture that was taken by a fan, uh, Denise Caruso, D- Denise Corazon, yeah, who's a art teacher on Long Island here, and um, she uh, she was a uh, ardent fan and uh, had front row seats and a great camera and a great eye and and took uh, some incredible pictures of the Ramones and the Police and mm-hmm. uh, some other bands uh, that nobody else has. Wow, and. Just to go back, uh, if you're if, if you only want to look look up a little bit of the history of the Ramones, uh, Monty Melnick's book uh, on tour with the Ramones, especially because many of the Ramones are no longer with us, which mm-hmm. is quite sad. Um, but you know, we have here Carl Perkins. Now let me tell you, Carl Perkins is another one. I actually went to Memphis. I did a show. Uh, did you? About, I, oh. I, I went to Sun Studios. Wow. And uh, I went with it with my wife Michelle. We went to uh, in January of '08. We went to Sun Studios, and we we actually were in the the, the room where the Million Dollar Quartet was. Mm-hmm. And we actually were at the microphone that Elvis sang off of. That's and we cool. did a whole little show uh, from there. But that's Carl Perkins. And uh, I remember the story about um, Blue Suede Shoes. Uh, did you know the story? No, no. He was in some bar or something like that. And he was listening to two people fight. Like somebody spilled beer like on this guy. And he goes, hey, hey, don't step on my <laughs> Blue Suede <laughs> Shoes. <laughs> And that became like a huge song. And then when Elvis covered it, I think it freaked him out because everybody thought it was Elvis' song even though it was his song. Mm -hmm. Now, here's something very interesting. You have a picture here of Jan Hammer. Now, people may not know that the theme from Miami Vice was written by Jan Hammer. That's, I guess, his very famous thing. Well, Jan Hammer was was, was an excellent uh, musician and band leader, a lot of uh, rock fusion in the the 70s, uh, and he played with... uh, uh, Jeff Beck, and, sure. and um, I was on the road with Jan and Jeff Beck, and uh, my my favorite Freeway story Jam about Buffalo. It was um, well, it was I think it was after Freeway Jam, uh, but it was in the late seventies, and um, we were up in Buffalo. It was snowing, and Jeff Beck, who's British, hadn't been around the states very much and never been in Buffalo. And we went out for a walk in. Uh, I, I I remember like it's yesterday. We went for a walk outside the. We were probably staying at a Holiday Inn or something. And walked like two blocks outside of the hotel, and he stopped, and he looked around Buffalo, and he just said, I'm good. a god <laughs> place. What are we doing here? And I said, you know, I'm, I, I don't know. I, I'm from Queens, New York. I'm not from Buffalo. I can't defend it. And uh, we, I, I, saw him, I saw him another time, and he kind of remembered, like, weren't we in Buffalo together? <laughs> <laughs> so I equate Buffalo with uh, Jeff Beck and Jan Hammer. Wow. You are listening to Taking Care of Business with Richard Solomon, 88.1 FM, broadcasting from Studio 2 at the Abrams Communication Center with my very special guest, Steve Rosenfield, who is the uh, principal author of a book called Fun and Dangerous, Untold Scenes, Unseen Photos, and Unearthed Music from My Father's Place, 1975 to 1980. Uh, His co-author is Michael Epi Epstein, who was the operator of the legendary My Father's Place from 71 to 87. And he is an international talent manager and independent promoter and, and a cool guy. He's got some great stories. And mm-hmm. although we couldn't get him here today, we will definitely uh, 
we'll, we'll definitely uh, have him back. He uh, wanted to be here. He just uh, fell ill this morning, but he'll be back. He's he he was in the room more than I was with the stories. <laughs> well, let's put it this way: we're going to have him back, and we'll definitely do a follow up show. Um, Matt, Matt Guitar Murphy. Wow, I know Matt Guitar Murphy because he was in the Blues Brothers band. Well, the story is that uh, when. Um, uh, John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd uh, were thinking about starting the Blues, uh, the Blues, Bro- Brothers. Blues Brothers. They uh, came out to see Matt Murphy play at U.S. Blues in Roslyn. There was yes, another right club. down the street. So there was another right around the corner. There was another club called the um, uh, U.S. Blues, and um, probably named after the Grateful Dead song. They 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 went to see Matt. Matt came. Uh, Matt was playing with. I forgot the name of the artist. Matt was playing both at U.S. Blues and my father's place the same night. He'd just go back and forth. <laughs> so Belushi and Ackroyd would go to my father's place, then to U.S. Blues, and go back and forth. And um, that's the first time they met Matt. And Matt was a, a you know, a seminal figure. Well, not, that's not the right word. He was in, integral to the, the launch of the Blues Brothers. Because, you know, Dan and, and I, don't, I don't know them. I shouldn't call them by their first names. Mr. Ackroyd and Mr. Belushi uh, did their homework, and they had to learn – about Chicago blues from the people who were authentic uh, Chicago blues musicians, and 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 Matt Guitar Murphy is a, an example of uh, of you know a real authentic figure. So, the you know the birth of the Blues Brothers occurred actually in Roslyn, New York. Wow. Well, not too far from Saturday Night Live. <laughs> No, there was there. <laughs> right, they, were, they were out there quite a bit. Uh, Epi uh, Epi would drive those guys back into the city for uh, for a late night dinner at Wohop. And, Wohop, uh, you know they have they don't know who each other. They, they didn't know you know he didn't know they were these guys who were on Saturday Night Live. They were originally a Second City uh, review, Second Second City. Yeah, yeah, from Chicago, an improvisational comedy group. So you know when you're 21 and a comedian um, who hasn't quite. Uh, made it to the national stage. Here's the the club owner who gives you a lift into uh, into the back to the city instead of you having to take the Long Island Railroad. Was it was a quality human being, and so uh, he and Dan Aykroyd are still friends today. Wow. Well, now, what's kind of interesting is you were talking about all that stuff, and we have a picture here of Jim Steinman and Meatloaf, which is what you were talking about. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's interesting that the Blues Brothers had their roots really in Roslyn. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of yeah. cool. You know. Yeah, I was, um, you know, I went out to the club when I was um, 16, and um, I had a camera with me because uh, I just had a, a kind of an interest in, in, in photography. And, you know, the the trick, I guess, was that I would, uh, I got into, I, I must have paid to get into the club the first time. Epi saw me uh, and said, well, you know, could you take a picture of me and somebody, because I had a camera around, and I did, and I, uh, I did, and then I, I, I went the extra mile of actually going back and giving it to him, and uh, he thought that was incredibly um, um, uh, mature and uh, responsible and helpful, so basically, to make it really a short story, he said, you keep coming and giving me the photos, you can keep coming for free. And I went, wow, free. This is, this was it's usually good. good. This was good. <laughs> so, uh, so there was never any money changing hands here. And over the time, a lot of the photos that you see here were on the wall in the bar of Epi and, and, and some of the musicians. And he gave me terrific access. So I, it's kind of a home away from home, uh, from home for me for, uh, for four or five years. Uh, but it was simply because, I had the initiative or the good sense or nothing else to do to, to drive back to Roslyn from Queens and give him a copy of the photo I took. Now let, let's, that, that, that seemed to resonate with him. Let's talk about real, real, you know, I have an 8-track player in my, my office, believe it or not. Did you go to the Kodak, like, little photo mat booths mm-hmm. that were, like, shopping centers and give it to the guy? And that, is that how you had it developed? Because back then, you know, that, it wasn't like today where everybody has a, an iPhone or a cell phone with a camera in it. No, it was uh, that was way too expensive, uh, Rich. I, I couldn't afford that. So I, it was all shot in black and white. Um, so the photos were in black and white, and I set up a little uh, uh, dark room in the basement of my parents' house. Wow! And uh, believe it or not, I used to af- after coming home at uh, you know one or two in the morning uh, would uh, develop the film that night because I was so excited to see what it looked like, and then I'd wake up in the morning and then bring it to whether it was the record companies who hired me after a while, the, the, the management firms, or back to Epi. So the next day they got the photos, but it was only because I developed them, because it was cheaper than going to the uh, 
you know, sending it away for processing. Wow. So, over time, I over time I was able to uh, afford, you know, the professional processing. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a lot of smelly uh, chemicals involved in the first year or two. Wow. See, this is this is like gritty journalism. When, 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 no, this is like this is like gritty journalism where there were no cell phones, flip phones. You know, uh, when when things actually required creativity. And patience. And perseverance. Yeah. And perseverance. And I, know, I never knew if it was because I didn't have anything better to do <laughs> or I thought it was on to something. You know, it just uh, – it seemed like the right thing. No, you do. know, it's funny. You know, the struggle to create is interesting because I remember what the Beatles said in an interview a long time ago, which was they always struggled to find new sounds like Norwegian wood, all these things. They tried to get new sounds into the studio. And now, then they said, even back then, like later on, it was, I forgot who's, who said it in the interview, but they said, now there's too much sound and it's too easy. Mm-hmm. And, and in a way, I, I, I get that because now there's so much content and everybody has a camera and everybody's a journalist and everybody's a blogger mm-hmm. that, you know, sort of the whole thing is lost. But the struggle kind of sorted out the people who, you know, who use perseverance. And this book really is a great example mm-hmm. of, of that effort because it shows uh, patience. Our perseverance, and I'm sure there are millions of photos that didn't make the book, mm-hmm. either because somebody blinked or they ducked or <laughs> <laughs> someone stood in front of the camera at the wrong moment. It was quite an adventure uh, distilling, you know, tens of thousands of photographs down to, uh, for myself, uh, we, I had somebody um, uh, work on it for six months to take the negatives and contact sheets. She identified... 2,500 photos that we digitized that then we looked at from on a digital point of view um, and knocked it down to, I guess, 150 of mine. And then there are probably 60 or 70 from professional photographers who contributed as well as uh, fans who were there. And I thought that was... Uh, I thought that it brings a special flavor to the book because there were there were some people like Denise who were fans who were had a great eye took pictures uh, at seminal uh, at, I don't want to keep using that word at important times in the club uh, and then there are great photographers like Bob Gruen and Bette Roberts and um, uh, Gary Gershoff to just name a few who knew what kind of place it was, knew what, how important it was, um, and we're happy to contribute to uh, a recognition of what Epi and his partners and all the artists had built. So so we had three different sources of photos in the book. And I think that led a, a kind of a, I wouldn't say a chaos, but a, it, it's not one guy's view from, you know, left-handed guitarist, right-handed guitarist, up on stage, backstage. You know, it, it changes the variety. So I'm going to ask all the people out there who are listening to do me a personal favor. If you have a photo sure. out there and you were at my father's place uh, in its heyday, and you'd like to share it with us, mm-hmm. send me an email to tcbradio, wcwp, at yahoo.com. That's wc, uh, I'm sorry, that's tcbradio, wcwp, at yahoo.com. And I will forward it to Steve. And we'll probably get it on the, uh, make sure you tell us that it's cool to, to use it. And, um, you know, your name, we'll get, and we'll put it on myfathersplace.com, and maybe we'll put that as a little little, little add-on from, you know, today's show. Yeah, and if I could also mention, um, when we started, um, the idea for this, uh, this book and CD came up about two years ago. We, uh, we started a, a Friends of My Father's Place Facebook page, and um, almost overnight, I mean, within a month or two, we had thousands of people. So if you go to Facebook... <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me, and look up friends of my father's place. You'll see. Uh, I think it's up to twenty eight hundred uh, friends there, and there are hundreds of photographs, um, stories, and recollections of the community that over seventeen years, nineteen seventy one to nineteen eighty six, uh, saw some incredible shows and had some great times. So it, the community has um, reestablished itself on Facebook, uh, and um, uh, it's a trip down memory lane. So if you you kind of want to remember the Marshall Crenshaw. Uh, I remember Marshall Crenshaw. You know, you want to remember Brewer and Shipley or Ian Hunter or, you know, they, they, the names are there. It goes from, you know, Bonnie Bramlett and, and the Brecker brothers to Warren Zevon, who've been there, as well as the late the Warren Bil- Zevon, sadly. The, yeah. Sadly, yeah. The, as well as the Billy Joels and the Aerosmiths and the Bruce Springsteens and uh, the police and U2 and, and, and bands like that. So, kind of incredible array 
and diversity of of artists. Yes, that uh, that all played on that stage. Yeah, and and sadly, some of those voices are silent permanently, and yeah. that's a real shame. But at least they've been captured. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the police had their reunion tour a couple of years ago. I saw them at the Meadowlands, mm-hmm. um, and I saw Bruce. Uh, uh, not that long ago, and some of them still soldier on, and sadly, like you know, sort of like the Ramones, and when I remember Warren Zevon had, I think maybe his last performance with it may have been on David Letterman. I think it was, and uh, everybody knew he was not doing well physically, and mm-hmm. it was kind of sad. It was bittersweet because, you know, he was a very talented guy, Absolutely. and he died, you know, relatively young. You know, especially young. especially now that I'm older, <laughs> <laughs> I keep pushing that line of what right, old right, is. Right. <laughs> you know, further back. I don't think it's ever appropriate time to die, but uh, <laughs> 121. <laughs> yeah, even then, I think if I was 121, I'd be going for 122. <laughs> you know, exactly, exactly. So I see we have um, Emmy Lou Harris uh, and Dave Mason. Uh, Dave Mason, remember? I remember when Dave Mason was, I think, in Fleetwood Mac, mm-hmm. which is you know way back. Now, here it says, the president of Columbia Records lived in Roslyn and stopped by to see an unknown band from Milton, Massachusetts. It was 1974, and the band was Aerosmith. They did now, showcase there, yeah. Wow. Now, is that Steven Tyler? No, that's that Joe just, Perry. This is Joe Perry. That's Joe Perry. Right here. Yep. And then, I guess that should be Tony Kramer in the back. Right. Is it uh, Joey Kramer? Joey Kramer, that's right. Yeah. I, I may have known a Tony Kramer from, like, high school. <laughs> he was a football player. You know? <laughs> that, and then, it was Jerry the, Kramer. Who's this? Not sure. Okay. Not sure. I see a very, a very young picture of Hall & Oates. It's probably 76 or 77. It says 79. 79. And there's yeah. Harry Chapin. Wow. Mm-hmm. And, of course, we interviewed uh, on this show mm-hmm. uh, Jen Chapin. So Terrific guy, uh, Harry. Yeah. And let's see. Oh, that looks like William Martin Joel. Yes, sir. That's Mr. Joel on stage at my father's place. Now, I see you have a picture of the Good Rats. I love the Good Rats, and I remember way back, I don't know if they did that here, but at, at the end of the show, during their last, their last uh, tune, mm-hmm. they would take rubber rats and throw them out into the audience. Did they do that here? Yes. I, lo- I love that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's got to have a shtick. I mean, they, they were great. They still are. They're still playing, and um, Peppy's son plays in the band now, and uh, uh, the Good Guys, and um, uh, still Long Island's, one of Long Island's most uh, popular bands. In fact, I believe that they played in nineteen. Uh, sorry, in two thousand and ten, at in um, Glen Cove. Glen Cove. Uh, a friend of mine, Joe Manfredi, had. Um, he's like the MC of something called the Downtown Music Scene, and they have a, a number of very good free concerts mm-hmm. uh, in the summer. You bring your lawn chair, you sit out there. It's just it's just a phenomenal little thing, and I've seen it. A hardcover band, which was great, and I remember uh, the Good Rats mm-hmm. uh, performed in two thousand and ten. So. So they're here. Still Alive and Kicking. What, what, what record was that? That was the name of an album, Still Alive and Kicking. Well, I know that it Alive was, and Kicking was, I think, uh, In Excess or... or uh, no. was it, I think it may have been In Excess, but anyway. And there's a picture of uh, Lou Reed. And I, again, uh, you have uh, Joan Jett here with The Runaways. And uh, Bob Gruen took that photo, I see. Yep. And we, we saw him at the uh, Long Island Music Hall of Fame Awards. Yeah, congratulations. He was inducted into Long Island Music Hall of Fame. That's pretty good for a photographer. I mean, you know, we don't... <laughs> you know, we're usually right behind the drummer in terms of getting... And, and the tour manager in terms of getting recognition. So, when yeah, you know, great, uh, great congratulations to Bob to being recognized for his body of work. So there you go. Oh, okay. It's time for a station ID, of course. You are listening to 88.1 FM, WCWP. The show is Taking Care of Business with your host, Richard Solomon. I'm here with Steve Rosenfield, uh, author of uh, Fun and Dangerous Untold Sales. Untold, uh, speaking of sales, by the book. See, that was a Freudian. Untold (laughs) Tales, uh, but definitely help sales. Uh, Unseen photos and unearthed music from my father's place, 75 to 80. Uh, we're just kind of like flipping through the book because this book is just one of those great rare books that you, if you love music and if you love the history of music and if you grew up in a time when rock and roll really was just awesome, you know, back in the day, um, this is really the kind of book that you want to have. And you're going to say something. Yeah, you know, it's been, it's been wonderful to watch people uh, leaf through the book because different people stop at different photos. And so... Um, and, you know, you don't know who's a Charlie Daniels fan and you don't know who's a, uh, uh, an Emmy Lou Harris, uh, Har- you know, Emmy Lou, um, Harris, yeah. Emmy Lou Harris fan. Uh, but 
they you know you sit and you look you know as I watch people as they go through the book it brings back memories it's not one of these books where you flip through it very quickly because they're kind of struggling to go I think I was there or I remember that song or could that be it you know and it's because it's 35 years uh, ago and um and it's nice to it's it's nice to have something you put on your coffee table that people pick up and they go oh man I remember were you there did you see this and and you know for for a half hour an hour you're 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 going back along with the music obviously you're going back to a time when um, people our age were were teenagers or in our twenties and um, uh, it's 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 nostalgia but it's it's sweet now, it's, I don't want to say this publicly but I guess I have to. I always thought the music in this day was just better than it is today. And I'm sorry, I, you know, I don't want to sound like my parents who said that the music you of the 40s like parents, <laughs> was better than the music of, like, you know, the 60s. Although my parents were rapid Beatles fans. It was the funniest thing. When the Beatles came to America, my parents took me in the early 1960s. They were staying at some hotel, and we were part, me, you know, I was like four or something like that. And we were all outside the hotel screaming with everybody. And, you know. That's you, cool parents. Yeah. And, you know, I, I grew up in Whitestone. Mm -hmm. And uh, you weren't that far being right. in Fresh Meadows. And when the Beatles played at Shea Stadium, that wasn't that was really local. that far. No, we could walk, right? <laughs> you know? So, but, but I really felt that people had something to really say in the music of this day. There was passion. There were great lyrics. The music was rich and complex. It wasn't sort of this stuff made on a computer and, you know, sort of like this whole, air. even like album cover art was like, you know, awesome in those days. But what I, can I tell you? Yeah, you know, I, th I think every year, every, every time, every time somebody turns 16, there's a, there's a new fan born for whatever type of music. And I think there, there are probably as many, if not more, hardcore music fans than than ever it's just that there's so much diversity in music now and there are less curators as we, we were talking about earlier this yeah the radio uh, used to be radio would would would, would filter yeah. and select what uh, they thought the best songs were and now those filters are pretty much gone because of the corporate takeover of radio uh, so you know, just, you have to go to the internet, and and you know, and iTunes isn't going to tell you which is better. They may tell you which more people buy, but that's not the same thing. Also, there was something about going to record stores. You know, I'll tell you a great story. Mm. My friend Rob Minster and I uh, are huge music people. Love music. You know, we're not musicians, and but we love music. And we went to Canada on a, just a trip for fun. And in those days, they had an equivalent to sort of like Tower Records, which sadly mm. in, is gone. Uh, and there was one both in Manhattan on Broadway, and there was one uh, in the shopping center right off of Old Country Road. Mm -hmm. And we went to a place called Sam the Record Man, and there was one in Montreal, and there was one in Toronto. And in those days, the exchange rate was incredible. Mm -hmm. So albums were sort of like $5. We bought, I think we went one weekend or two weekends, we bought about 100 albums each. Wow. So... You know, so maybe over the course of two different trips. So we were able to really stock up our CD collection mm -hmm. with things that may have been selling in America for 16 bucks for $5. Mm -hmm. And we got all of these things were considered imports as well. Mm -hmm. So I remember buying a Jethro Tull album of unreleased stuff. Mm -hmm. And it said, oh, uh, the, the brothers and sisters of these songs made it big, but, but these are the people who got forgotten. Mm -hmm. And I have, I have things like... Um, I have uh, Paul Rogers doing something called the Jimi Hendrix set, mm -hmm. uh, where he does nothing but Jimi Hendrix covers. And they have these rare gems, and yet one of the great joys of in this day of music was that you'd go to record stores, you'd find the new album, you'd hear about a perfect album sign on a radio station. People like N.E.W. back then and mm -hmm. L.I.R. played, you know, quote, alternative, progressive music. Mm -hmm. um, you had DJs like Scott Muni, who like were friends of the Beatles, and you felt, you felt connected. I just had that, uh, I re revisited that experience, so I know exactly what you're talking about. I was in uh, North Carolina to visit my, uh, for Thanksgiving to visit my family, and uh, we had a rental car and had some time to kill in between. You know, we're there for three days to have a three-hour meal, but you know how that works. And uh, I stopped off and bought uh, Bruce Springsteen's The Promise, which yeah. is a uh, <clears throat> re-release uh, in addition to uh, his uh, songs uh, just before Darkness on the Edge of Town. So it was 1978. So essentially it's a, it's a two-CD 
And DVD? Uh, and DVD. Yeah. Uh, I just bought the CD because I had the uh, the rental car. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and I, I was in North Carolina Hills this November. It had just come out the week before. And I put on, you know, two CDs back-to-back driving around. Now, the last time, because, I mean, you know, you, we're looking at each other going, remember when we used to listen to albums? Well, listening to albums meant listening to 12 songs, 8 to 12 songs. When was the last time you listened to an album? It's really a kind of a, a lost... Of uh, a lost practice, and so just this November, I put on a, an album that Bruce re-released from 1978 called "The Promise," so, you know, and played it straight through driving. It was a great experience. Oh yeah, and it, you know, I, I had forgotten what listening to an album was like. Oh, and so it, I, I hardly recommend it. It was just a massive amount of fun. I remember when there were concept albums. You know, things like Jethro Tull's Thick as a Brick. <laughs> well, you, had to wait, you had to wait for the payoff or, you know, you, things would be connected. And now, you know, it, it's not that it's worse. It's just different now. Well, I remember, like, for example, Todd Rundgren's uh, Road to Utopia, which was a great album. Mm-hmm. That was kind of a concept album. It had a whole theme to it and there was a progression. Mm-hmm. Um, but I actually do listen to CDs in my office. What I do is a lot of times I have to work on a Sunday. Mm-hmm. And instead of kind of listening to... I try to listen to a lot of different radio for, you know, for professional reasons. Like, mm-hmm. I listen to E Street Radio okay. on uh, XM Sirius. And when The Promise came out, Bruce actually with, did an entire, with Dave Marsh, right? you know, entire, like, program of call-ins and email-ins. And it was, it was beautiful to listen to because it really brought you back to the 70s. Right, right. Well, if, if, on the flyleaf, uh, little Stephen uh, gave us a quote. Um, it kind of harkens back. It may harken back to the kind of time that... The uh, that my father's place when it was his heyday, and he and he wrote that just aren't. It's a shame there aren't places like this anymore. Who, where where musicians were nurtured, incubators, incubators, and you know there was a stepping stone, and you'd start at my father's place, play uh, here on Long Island. The three thousand seat hall was called the Calderon in the city. It was called uh, the Fillmore or Academy yeah. of Music. That was the three thousand, and then the top of the food chain was Nassau Coliseum or my, or uh, Madison Square Garden, and that was you know one two three. And that's that was the ladder that musicians knew um, they had to climb uh, to to be more and more successful. And th- those rungs are <laughs> those r- none of those rungs are there except for Nassau Coliseum and, and, and the garden and, and the garden and uh, and the garden has like hockey and other things. <laughs> right. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> to sustain it. Yeah, yeah. the <laughs> economics of concert promotion are you know upside down from the way they used to be. But but let me right. read this quote. Yeah. This is a quote from September of 2010 from Little Steven, known as Steven Van Zandt of the E Street Band. We were lucky we grew up when we did. We had 10 rock and roll TV shows on, fabulous radio shows playing everything cool, and clubs like my father's place waiting for us if we reached that first level of success. Clubs like my father's place got you to your next level of success if you earned it. Venues like that no longer exist. And fewer and fewer bands are making it to a second level of success. And that's not a coincidence. That's a tragedy. Little Steven, New York. Yeah. 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 In fact, I, I met Little Steven on Broadway. He was in the audience with a couple of friends. And uh, mm-hmm. I forgot the show. I don't know if we were seeing... Um, I forgot what the show is, but he was there, and it was like, wow, that's a little steep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't, don't, don't look at it. You know? <laughs> well, he, he's done you know, his uh, Underground Garage uh, yes. radio show. Which is, X- a, which is XM, XM. Uh, 59, yes. Yeah, yeah you know, terrific uh, uh, a way to nurture um, emerging bands, you know, and he's a guy who, you know, given back, uh, helping aspiring artists, and it's great to, it's, you know, it's great to see. Well, you know, it's kind of cool. Um, some of the, the great rock people do give back. Like Bob Dylan has something called Theme Time Radio, mm-hmm. and he has he has phenomenal stuff, and he's mm-hmm. brilliant. And then I think uh, Tom Petty has something called Buried Treasures, mm-hmm. and then you have Little Stevens Underground Garage. So there's a few places in the corners here and there. Well, we, we our little uh, uh, contribution to giving back is that uh, anybody who buys a book through the Long Island Music Hall of Fame, uh, we make a sizable donation uh, back to the Long Island Music Hall of Fame. Uh, Epi and my father's place were inducted into the uh, Hall of Fame in November. That was when the book debuted, November 16th. And uh, they recognize, along with Lou Reed and Bob Gruen and Al Cooper and a number of uh, other people. And Carolyn Paul from the Magic Garden. <laughs> and other people. <laughs> uh, you know, I interviewed they had them. a big gala yeah. and it was a lot of fun. 
but uh, they raise money for music scholarships uh, for Long Island schools. And so if you buy the book uh, through Long Island Music Hall of Fame, we donate a, a portion of the book sales back to them. And um, it's also available on uh, Amazon, Amazon sure. or MyFathersPlace.com. There's a link. That's great because you, although this is radio, this is one of those things where I wish you could see all that I see and all that, you know, because this brings back for me just tremendous memories. And even if you didn't grow up in the in the day, all this music is still being played in all kinds of places. And it even pops up even in commercials now. Mm -hmm. Like I think Paradise by the Dashboard Light is now on some commercial somewhere. Mm -hmm. And you just have to remember that all of that music that you know so well today had to start somewhere. And it really started in an incubator on Northern Boulevard right here and, you know, not that far from the station. Um, so I'm looking at some other pictures, and here's like a picture of um, Epi, let's see, uh, with, oh, uh, with uh, Bobby Alessi uh, and Pepe Cascio. Is that the Good Rats? No, that's uh, Barnaby Bye. That was one of my favorite, band, favorite bands there. Barnaby Bye was a big Long Island band. Uh, they're they're still playing. They still play around. They they're all live out here, and uh, they were signed to Atlantic and had a couple of good, uh, uh, several good records. Wow. Room to Grow was the first one, if I recall. Wow. And here's Deborah Harry, of course, from Blondie. Mm -hmm. And here's, here's a very young Linda Ronstadt. She, she, she was older than me. She was <laughs> <laughs> this is Linda Ronstadt. says, after Linda Ronstadt gave a command performance at an early show, the fans didn't want her to stop. After two encores, the crowd was screaming for more. She told Epi that she didn't know any more songs. <laughs> he suggested Heat Wave by Martha and the Vandellas. It was an awesome final encore and became one of the, her signature songs and the best-selling record she ever had. Yep. So there you go. Now, I have a, great, a very interesting story. I was on an airplane back from, I think, Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And there were a bunch of people carrying on and drinking champagne. And, and so, so On the way back or the way on the to? Way, on the way back. Wow, that was, that's unusual. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I was kidding around and... Uh, I think I said something like, I wonder what the FAA would say all about this. And uh, the woman said, well, would the FAA like a glass of champagne and like to join the party? And I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> and it turned out to be the, the, the whole Vandellas. And, and oh. Martha was way up in the front. Mm -hmm. And they were kind enough to give me, they were doing some kind of Broadway show or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I have, they all autographed it for me. Right. And this is before I did the radio. I would have been, oh, if I had a microphone. And, but this is also before 9-11 when... Mm -hmm. You know, people are able to bring their own bottles of champagne. <laughs> yes, yeah. security. You know, the the um, uh, the right word is the, the artist lacked uh, artifice. I, I don't know if I'm using it properly, but but you know, back in those days, it was uh, it was much 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 less commercial. And, oh yeah, and everybody was more accessible. You know, uh, the artists would hang out with the guys at the bar, the girls at the bar. Uh, much more approachable. There wasn't a retinue of people, publicity agents. There weren't. Uh, the velvet rope thing. Yeah, it wasn't that they were so much uh, more superior than their fans, and and you know they were everybody. Everybody was a struggling artist, whether you're Patti Smith or Charlie Daniels or Billy Joel. I mean, and that that was the they era. were real then. They were real. They did. They lacked the artifice that a lot of people build up over time, and and uh, and that's you know for those of us, it wasn't just me who had access uh, upstairs and downstairs and so on. It wasn't just to me. You could tell. I think the the people in the stand, you know, sorry, in the stands, there weren't stands. People sitting at the tables that were built out of old bowling alley uh, slats <laughs> uh, could tell that you know they weren't vastly superior, or vastly different. They just happened to be working on a craft, and and so so the the performers genuinely connected with the audience it wasn't uh there wasn't a great discre discrepancy and I, that i think has been lost i don't i don't think and i'm not so sure music is better or worse but the connection between the artists uh and 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 their fans it, it, you know is is completely different now well you know what it is I, I i look at something like bruce springsteen when he was struggling in the beginning as an artist and he wrote about pain and and struggle mm -hmm. From a personal point of view, like Badlands, mm -hmm. um, there was something about those songs that just, uh, you know, uh, even th songs like Tunnel of Love, where he says, you got to learn to live with what you can't rise above. Mm -hmm. um, they were so heartfelt. And I think that's because he was still remembering what it was like to 
to play the clubs, to do the schlepping, to haul yeah. your own equipment, and to mm-hmm. come from humble origins and right. deal with the draft in Vietnam and friends maybe getting killed or whatever it was. And it's different now when life is a lot easier and it's more accessible and it's all easy. You know, you just turn on your computer and you've got GarageBand and you crank something out and, you know, but, it's done in five minutes. Yeah, that's the connection. I mean, the, the artists are contemporaries, were contemporaries with their fans. Yes. You know, and, and um, you know, it, it could have been people in the, stand, in the seats being up on stage. You know, they were aspiring artists you know, watching as well as performing. So, uh, and again, you know, and I think maybe little Stephen, the way he said it made sense. It, it was, it was arguably the first rung on the ladder of success to bigger and better things. And artists knew it was a big deal to play my father's place because we're, we, we, and, and be invited back. You, you know, you've, got to a rung on the ladder, you pulled yourself up, and now you're ready for the next phase. And and, 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 and you you're need to launch, And you need to launch off of that. So you had to play with heart. Right. And you had to play it mattered. With, with vigor. Mm-hmm. Because if you grab those people, mm-hmm. that was your opportunity. And if you, if you blew it, that may have been sort of the stall out. Exactly. Exactly. You are listening to an incredibly special episode of Taking Care of Business with Richard Solomon, your host. Uh, Taking Care of Business can be found on iTunes. Uh, If you look under TCB Radio, you can catch us on the internet at tcbradio.com. We are streamcast at mywcwp.org. And you can catch us also at uh, 88.1 FM as you uh, drive around here. And we're always on uh, podcast at right now. Our podcast site is tcbradio.mypodcast.com but that may be changing we're going to try to upgrade and maybe go to a better a better format so uh need some IT help again <laughs> oh absolutely <laughs> you know uh, well, you do media consulting and all this other great stuff so I may need you to help us with that um you know <laughs> You know, yeah, we, we have a lot in common. No, I got I, you know, I I, I helped get uh, Epi. Uh, I got Epi his uh, myfather'splace dot com site back. So I so uh, we, rare occurrences. Yeah, he did not have he did not own myfather'splace dot com. So uh, we got that back as, as the precursor to doing the book and the CD. We oh uh, wow. We you know we wanted to make sure it was easy for people to find uh, find what was going on in my father's place. By the way, myfatherplace.com, amazon.com, uh, Long Island Music Hall of Fame. Uh, I forgot right. I forgot what their website is. It's, it's something uh, like Long Island Music, music yeah, dot dot org something or something. Yeah, but long, if you type yeah. in uh, Google Long yeah. Island Music Hall of Fame, it's the first one. Yeah. Um, there aren't two. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, and I was honored enough uh, to uh, have been there as a member of the media and as a guest of uh, Jack Lerner, so that was kind of cool. Um, and so we all got to hang out, and uh, we've got to see you at your booth and uh, signing people, books. And people sign sign books, and I, I saw a lot of very famous people come by to visit, and uh, and and really, it was share after spending um, a year and a half doing this. It was uh, it was it, it was great to have a, a large a launch party associated with the Long Island Music Hall of Fame reception. So it was it was my honor to be there, and. Uh, we had we had a great t- we all had a great time didn't we Rick? oh yeah absolutely you know there was some really <laughs> cool look I got to I saw Joan Jett and Al Cooper and you know just all kinds of people so let's go back to the book for a second um, because well, to tell you this is like the fastest radio so we have pictures here this is Bob Weir wow now that that's pretty wild because in seventy seven Bob Weir was actually pretty famous already sure you know sure well Kingfish and Grateful Dead they all played uh, Grateful Dead as a band never played under the name Grateful Dead because the place would have been over, you know just yeah. overrun but every one of the ba- guys in the band played with, with some assembly of, uh, of, of supporting musicians they uh, if you looked at my if you looked at the catalog of my uh, the bands that I shot the Kingfish and Bob Weir and those iterations were probably uh, um, one of the most frequent players during 75 to 80. Well, I believe that the very first big concert that I went to was in 1978. I saw the Jefferson Starship and the Bob Weir Band at the Nassau Coliseum. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that was when Grace Slick mm-hmm. you know, was in the band, and she had just an, an incredible voice. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, there's, some, there's some female vocalists out there like... You know, Anna and Nancy Wilson of Heart, sure. um, who have just, you know, but, but I remember Grace Slick 
just had just an unbelievable voice. She and, was at uh, the club. Uh, you know, said Marty Ballin was at the club. Um, Paul Katner. They 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 all played. They didn't play under the name Jefferson. You, you know, the yeah. bands like playing, uh, but don't always play under this under the names you'd know them as because it was only three hundred and fifty seats. It was yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, sometimes the Stones would do that. They would pick a club and they would come under like you know. Uh, murky sneaker. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And all of a sudden, you know, this is before cell phones where you couldn't really get the word out fast enough like, oh, my God, for $5, I'm seeing the Rolling Stones under a different name. Well, this, Lou, it, this story's in the book, but Lou O'Neill from Newsday, who was the music columnist back then, ran a story that the Stones were going to play the club. And um, uh, Epi had to put out uh, what was then a press release and go on the radio saying they're not coming, they're not coming. And he begged them actually not to come. Uh, it was in between their tour, uh, in between tour dates, and uh, they wanted to come and see Peter Tosh, and uh, who he, ended up doing a song with Mick Jagger. Yes, Walk yes. and Don't Look Back. Absolutely. So, uh, but he had a. You know, they would have burnt the place down if they if you could see the Rolling Stones in 1978 in a 350 seat club in the village of Old Roslyn. So, uh, it, the story's in the book there. But I have a another one. I just uh, you know people might be interested in. So uh, after uh, st- it was in 1978 in June. Uh, that uh, Peter Tosh was opening for the Rolling Stones on their tour, and they were playing. Uh, Peter Tosh played the club on a Thursday night. Stones didn't come and see him, but uh, I was there, and Epi uh, pulled me aside, and he said, um, hey, kid, would you do me a favor? And I say, sure, because I'm a kid. And he <laughs> goes, um, would you drive these guys down to Philly for their show with the Stones? And I go, sure. Which guys? He goes those guys, and it was it was Peter Tosh and his um, and his rhythm section, which are Robbie Shakespeare and Sly Dunbar, who are the two fam- two most famous bass and guitar players in, in in the history of reggae. And Peter Tosh. That must have been one interesting car ride. So I, I've got my '73 Celica pulling up to the Holiday Inn in Hempstead at noon the next day, Friday. And um, they don't come down till three. <laughs> okay, because it's rock and roll. Yeah, three massive Rastafarian guys. I mean, they're <laughs> Peter Tosh is like six six. Um, I didn't know he's that tall. He's yeah. very very tall. If you look in Keith's book Life, you'll see a picture. You can see how tall he is, and there's a picture of Ra- uh, a Sly as well. Anyway, the, and I'm a pretty tall guy as well. <laughs> so the Jewish kid from Queens and three Rastafarians take off. Three hours late to go to JFK Stadium in Philly, and uh, driving down the Jersey Turnpike, I, I, I don't know the right way to say it, but let's just say our our senses were blunted, uh, <laughs> and we didn't get pulled over. But I pulled into JFK Stadium that night, and and um, I hope you had a backstage pass. <laughs> we had uh, the the funny. St- I mean, it's kind of a longer story, but I'll I'll try to make it quick. the The story is so we went out there, and I got to stand uh, at JFK Stadium on the star. The night before, empty stadium during a sound check. So where Mick was standing, you know, the next night, the next day, afternoon, with 80,000 people, you know, it was, it was kind of a surreal experience. So um, I was deemed uh, safe to be with the band and stuff like that. So we went back to the hotel. That part I don't remember. But the next day we went at noon or so, we went to the, uh, the band was going on at about one in the afternoon. We get there, they do their show. Foreigner is on next. Uh, my stay, we watch Foreigner. I'm backstage. I'm in. I'm in the trailers with the Rolling Stones and Peter Tosh, uh, Keith, and and the, the reggae guys are very close. And Mick likes them too. And I, I mean, I I, rem- I put my camera outside the trailer. And this was this is Keith's trailer. This wow. is there's no backstage pass for Keith's trailer. There is there are zones, <laughs> and then there's zones where there are no passes. This is the zone. It was I think it was Mick's tra- uh, trailer actually, and. Um, but then anyway, when the Stones went on, I was like, oh, this is going to be really cool. I'll be on the stage. I'll be taking pictures. And for whatever reason, I couldn't get a pass to be on the stage to shoot, which is what I was able to do for Peter Tosh and Foreigner. And I don't know why, but I kind of took it the wrong way, so I left. And I never saw the Stones. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of left Peter and, and Sly and Robbie. Uh, you know, I'm sure they managed, but, uh, but, but it was an example of being 18, 19 or whatever. Maybe I was... 78, I was 20. Okay. I was 20 years old and uh, having incredible access to and seeing incredible things and having an exper- incredible experience and then leaving in a huff because it's like, hey, and if I'm not going to shoot the stones from the stage, 
you know, I don't need to be here. I'm just going to go home. You're like, what I thought was going to... I'm going to go back to Fresh Meadows. I'm going back to Fresh Meadows. I'm going to sit in my room because that's better. So, you know, I, uh, it wasn't all good judgment. And that's that's a good example of, uh, you know, it seemed to make sense at the time, but um, the story could have continued if I had only stayed. Now, there's, there was a reason why. No, but just... the, and, the reggae, and the reggae was such a big part of, uh, of my father's place. I mean, that's, uh, it was a lot of fun to be uh, part of the start of a, a whole musical genre here, on, here in America. Now, it's interesting. You actually have pictures here of Epi with both Keith Richards mm -hmm. and a very young-looking Ronnie Wood. They, they was because he was young. Yeah. <laughs> I actually went to Amsterdam and saw Ron Wood's art studio mm -hmm. where they have a lot of his uh, artwork, which is kind of fascinating stuff. Yeah. And you mentioned Keith's book. I, a friend of mine, my friend Dave, uh, told me that it was a really good book. It's fantastic. It, I'm, I'm almost finished with it. It is, in, and I was going to bring it up earlier. Um, it's called Life, Keith Richards. As a co-author, I want to promote co-authors. Sure. <laughs> but but uh, uh, you talk about uh, you talked about earlier, Rich, the the passion that musicians have for getting it right, and 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 the perseverance that they have for f for finding a perfect sound. And and I was just re I was reading. Keith's book uh, again last night, and you know a lot of this is the all the tricks that oh, sorry all the tricks that uh, master musicians have. Whether you're Bo Diddley, Keith Richards, uh, Wadi Wattel, it, they all have these. You know, they put a blanket over an amplifier, turn it at forty five degrees, and put a can of Coke that's half filled next to the amplifier, and that's how you got the sound from Wild Horses. You know, and and he talks about it in the book, and it's kind of interesting. You know, it's it's not plug in your iPod or or use a synthesizer. Um, they they go into different studios. Sometimes they play outside. Sometimes they play in basements. They have all these different baffles and acoustical tricks um, that achieve a unique sound. And as a musician, Keith was in his book. He's always talking about trying to find. A he's, chase he's always chasing this perfect sound or this perfect melody and things like that. It's very interesting. Well, I know that Eddie Van Halen, for example, wouldn't let anybody see how he played in the beginning because he had a very, very unique style. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at things, he would either play like sort of with his back to you or like you just couldn't really see his fingering mm -hmm. because he never wanted to be reverse Copied. engineered. Copy, yeah. right, yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and again, in, the, in, in Keith's book, he talks about how once the guy explains to you how he did it, it's like, oh, I mean, yeah. it's three or four, oh, you know, it's oh. so obvious. You it's just so put nice on the bread and that's it. Exactly. <laughs> But 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 you know you, you don't know what you don't know. Fish don't know they're in water. I like to say, right? Nobody yeah, told them true. they're in water. They don't, know, they don't know there's something besides water. So um, musicians are always. It's the quest that's kind of. Uh, it's the quest and the practice that uh, makes it uh, incredibly special. So here's a picture of some reggae people, and uh, let's see because we only have like wow we have three minutes left and. Uh, so there's Jay. No Hall. time for the music, huh? Oh, yeah, we're gonna do, no, we're going to oh. do this. We're going we're gonna to finish this show out, and then we're going to start another show. We're going to do some music in that okay. show, and then I'll clip in some other stuff. Check. So, so we're actually going to have an expanded version of this. Wow. So, so okay. You're so, going to throw it to the internet. So, Just like no, John no, Stewart. No, be part no. of the next broadcast. Yeah. I understand. So let's see. You got uh, the Talking Heads, and wow. Look at this. Elvis Costello. I know Burning Spear. Uh, let's Brewer see. and Shipley. You skip right over Brewer and Shipley. Wait, I mean, wait. one toke over the line. Oh, there you go. No, you just, it, when you have <laughs> two minutes, you got to like really focus. That, I remember that song. Too. Well, see, you see, some of the photos are like fan favorites, and some of the photos are favorites of photographers. Is that Maria Moldau? That is Maria Midnight Moldau. at the Oasis? Midnight at the oh, Oasis. Oh, wow. I'm, yes. I'm probably dating myself. <laughs> I, I left out Melissa Manchester because I knew, you know, that would be over the top for you, Rich. Oh, now that's cool. Now, see, there's Todd Rundgren. Who I believe was from Great Neck, uh, in, you know. From, I don't, it might be I, I, that I don't know. You know, let's see. And there's a wow, Belinda Gar Carlisle with the Go Go's, and there's David Johansson, Rick Derringer, Rock and Roll Coochie Coo. Hang on, Sloopy. Let's see now. Um, got a picture of Lou Reed. Let's see who else we have here. Pictures of Epi, it's Suzanne Vega. Wow, and Roger McGuinn from the Birds. Wow. And here... That's Roger. Wow. And then there's Charlie Daniels. Mm -hmm. Wow, Kingfish. Graham Parker. I think Graham Parker, did he die? 
No, no, he's alive and kicking. He's oh. a good guy. He lives upstate. No, Graham's alive and kicking. Okay. <laughs> All right, so he's one of my favorites. Uh, you know, I, I my apologies. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Wow, you know, I saw Stevie Ray Vaughan at the Capitol Center in Maryland, mm-hmm. and it was just unbelievable. I think I saw, and here, of course, Pat Benatar, who you could still see on tour once in a while, like at the Westbury Music Fair. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's an example. Of those two, Pat Benatar and Steve, are the examples of bringing in other photographers who have great shots who were that were taken at the club. And I guess we have to wrap it up because we have 40 seconds, but there's George Carlin and Robert Klein. So this is what we're going to do. I'm going to sign out for today, and then we'll just keep you for a few minutes uh, for the next show. But this is Richard Solomon. Thank you for listening. I want you to really check out this this unbelievable piece of work. Fun and dangerous, untold sales, untold, untold tales. <laughs> Unseen photos. Yeah, I want you to buy the book. It's just Freudian. Uh, photos and unearthed music from my father's place, 75 to 1980. So this is Richard Solomon. Thank you for listening. We couldn't do it without you. We'll see you in a week. And next week, I promise we're going to have more with Steve Rosenfield. So thank you for listening. We'll see you soon. Thanks for listening.